thank you for, for joining us today. For today, this is the uh, third event in the Forced Migration in the Arts series, which aims to bring together artists, people with lived experience of forced migration, academics, and activists for conversation looking at the arts and forced migration. Uh, joining us tonight, this evening, we've got uh, Tonton Amisi Kaluba, who is a journalist, a human rights defender, and a gospel musician. Originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Tonton led a choir of about 200 singers of different ages and was also a newspaper columnist. Currently, he lives in Israel as an asylum seeker and keeps up his uh, career as a musician. We've also got Hamutau Sadan, who is a PhD candidate in Middle Eastern and African history at Tel Aviv University. Uh, Hamutau, Hamutau's research focuses on transitional art, forced migration, art in prison, and questions of censorship and power relations. She is also in, in 20, 19, he launched the Facebook uh, community, Art of Refugees in Israel, which is a platform for refugee artists to share their art, gain media exposure, and learn about new opportunities. And our third speaker is Dr. Didi Maimin Khan, who is originally from South Africa. And, and trauma specialist in humanitarian aid and intervention. Uh, she has over 27 years experience in working, work, working in uh, a, a number of countries and founded Kuchinate in, in 2011, which uh, gives which, which works with uh, women who are seeking refuge in, in Israel. Uh, so maybe we start with you, Tonton. If you could uh, just maybe say something about yourself and the work that you are doing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and good evening all. Thank you for joining this uh, wonderful experience. And uh, I cannot take it for granted. I appreciate all uh, the invitation that I received to be one of the tonight's uh, speakers. Uh, as you said it all, very good. Uh, I cannot say it uh, uh, that much, but uh, <laughs> a, I am a singer and a choir conductor. I, I am a conductor of uh, a choir called in Hebrew El Kev Chaim Hadashim, which uh, means which comes originally from French, Choral uh, which means uh, in English a new life choir. Uh, why new life? It's uh, a choir that uh, had a privilege to empower. Since now seven years, uh, it has the main objective of uh, enhancing worship at church. That was the objective of uh, the choir. Um, it's a choir of a uh, dozen, only a dozen of people, mostly asylum seekers from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where I am coming from, as you said. Uh, since five years, we were able to recruit one Israeli citizen, and uh, with him, the choir changed its uh, image of a Congolese Christian choir and uh, became a choir of people from different countries whose common purpose is uh, the art of music. Uh, as I said, and now we are a choir that goes around Israel 
for performances in different places and halls. Uh, and uh, living in Israel, we were obliged uh, to start singing in Hebrew and English, of course. Uh, not that we are one of the rare choirs that sing in more than four languages to because of uh, due to kind of uh, people we have in the choir and the crowd we sing to. Now we have not only people from Congo, a solemn seeker from Congo, we have people from uh, Burkina Faso and we have uh, people from Israel, as I said, uh, originally a Jew people and who joined the choir and the choir is uh, growing day and day. When I came to Israel, since seven years now, uh, I joined this uh, choir that was, uh, I, I mean, I joined a church that had a choir. Uh, it has a choir only, it had a choir only by name, but the choir uh, itself didn't really exist. Uh, people were not used on it, maybe because they didn't have uh, a conductor. They, I heard that people were coming, talented people I came, I joined the choir and uh, suddenly they just leave. They, uh, but since I came uh, from now six years, we have a choir of uh, about 12 people that can sing in uh, different halls that can, uh, uh, can hold different performances and uh, that we can really call today a choir. Uh, actually, I always want to talk about uh, this choir. I mean, my actual, uh, my current uh, presence here in Israel, uh, because when I'm, I, I'm thinking about who I was and what I was uh, having a choir of 200, more than 200 people, and now leading a choir of uh, only 10 or 12 people for different artists and uh, conductors, they can uh, understand uh, what kind of life or what kind of difficulties I can face or I am facing. And most of all, above all, uh, most of these singers were not, uh, were not professional singers or uh, some of them didn't know how to sing at all, but today they can handle melody. Today they can sing in front of a crowd of uh, 200 people. And uh, it's, uh, it's only by the grace of God, yes, but also a fruit of uh, a very long and uh, uh, encouraging uh, work. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tonton. And uh, we, we, we turn to you, uh, Didi. Maybe if you could also say something about yourself and uh, the work you are doing, and also why you are doing it. Didi, I think we cannot hear you. Is she speaking? She was trying to speak. <laughs> No, you don't have a sound. She had a sound before. Okay, while, while you are sorting uh, the sound out, we, we, we can turn. Okay, so while you are sorting the sound out, we'll turn to Hamutau. Okay, um, so hi everyone, thank you for joining. And thank you, Ambrose, for the invitation to this conversation. Um, I have sort of two hats um, as a speaker here. First, um, I'm a researcher at Tel Aviv University in Israel, a PhD student. I investigate art made by sound seekers um, who are painters in Israel, mostly from Eritrea and Sudan. Um, for the purpose of the research, I also created a Facebook group uh, several years ago. It's called Art of Refugees in Israel, and I invite you all to join this group. Um, this group is um, a platform uh, for artists who are asylum seekers to present their artwork and also um, to be exposed to all kinds of opportunities like call for applications, um, 
um, all kind of invitations to participate um, in art events. Um, in my thesis, my MA thesis, I also um, created a database of more than 200 artists who are sound seekers in Israel from all kind of mediums such as music, painting, photography, dancing, acting, um, film industry, etc. So I kind of became sort of like the matchmaker between um, people who want to organize um, art events or exhibitions or music festivals and the artists themselves. And I think this is like one of the purposes that I have as a researcher and an act as an activist um, to promote a sound seeker artist so that they will have more opportunities um, in Israel as artists and will be a part of the, the artistic milieu and also they can um, express themselves more and to be uh, more present in the Israeli public. Um, in addition, I have been volunteering at the Hotline for Refugees and Migrants. That's a name of an NGO, Hotline for Refugees and Migrants. And um, we have Sigal Rosen here, who is one of the founders of the Hotline. Um, for I think 24 years ago, it was founded. Um, and I've been starting to volunteer there um, five years ago, six years ago. And since one year and a half, I've been working there as a resource development manager. Um, and as a part of my position as a volunteer and as a worker at the hotline, I've also been um, organizing artistic events, cultural events, uh, curating art exhibitions. Um, and I think those kind of events are a good example for the way that we are trying to connect between the Israeli public and a sound seeking community on the one hand, but also um, to promote um, the discussion about asylum seekers' rights in Israel and to promote the artists themselves. Um, also, um, as a part of, as a researcher and an activist, um, at the moment, I'm organizing and producing um, an art workshop and that will, will eventually lead to an exhibition with a, a researcher, a French researcher named uh, Dr. Karen Akoka. And this art workshop will be for five painters, uh, women and, and men from South Sudan, um, Sudan and Eritrea. Um, and we're giving them the tools. Um, most of them are autodidact. So we're giving them the, tool, the tools uh, to present their artwork better, to express um, their thoughts about their artwork uh, so they can integrate better in the artistic media um, and to gain more experience and also to give them artistic tools uh, to build their capacity um, as artists in Israel, uh, to give them this opportunity that most of them were not exposed to um, as painters in their home countries since all the uh, complicated um, situation and politics in their homelands. Um, and I'm also participating in our research program uh, called Graffiti Art in Prison, um, talking about um, graffiti art made in prison, um, and there I'm presenting the case of uh, graffiti art made in uh, Holot Detention Center, which is a de detention center that was opened in Israel between 2013 and 2018, um, where um, asylum seekers from Eritrea and Sudan, men, were incar incarcerated. And that's about what I do now. And how did I get to do that? Um, in the beginning, when asylum seekers from Eritrea and Sudan started to arrive to Israel, um, in 2006, I started my uh, national service or civil service in Israel. Um, as you probably know, military service in Israel um, is obligated. I managed to not do military service, but to do civil service instead. And I was in a, I was in a youth village with uh, teenagers who are immigrants in Israel. And in our group, we also had um, um, several children who were sound seekers themselves and who came to Israel unaccompanied by themselves. Um, and then I started to get to, get to know, um, there I, get, I start to get to know with uh, the personal testimonies of asylum seekers. Um, I volunteered over the years with all kinds of uh, NGOs and eventually I found my home at the Hotline for Refugees and Migrants. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, and then we turn to you, uh, please. Didi, you just need to close. You need to turn off the sound. You need to turn off. We're both in the computer yeah, and the phone, so you need to turn off the sound on one of them because we hear something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Echo. 
Sorry, I'm bad. Sorry, Sorry, I'm bad. Sorry, I'm bad. Sorry, I'm bad. Sorry, I'm bad. Sorry, there's still an echo, so you need to turn on to turn off the sound on one of them. It was muted. It was I don't muted. know. I'm gonna do it off. It off. It, there's an echo because you're op you opened the Zoom meeting to okay, now it's better. Now I think it's only one. Can you try to talk? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Okay, hi very well. everyone. Thanks for your patience. I've having um difficulty with um my and so unfortunately I'm on my phone, so I won't be able to show you pictures, but maybe it will sort out in the course. So um, thank you for inviting me. And it's so nice to be here with, um, with all of you. Um, I am the co-founder and co-director of a African refugee asylum seeking organization in Tel Aviv called Kuchinate, which means to crochet into Grinia. And um, I started that with an Eritrean nun called Sister Aziza, who unfortunately cannot be with us because she is um away in Ethiopia at the moment. Um, the idea of this not-for-profit organization, which started 11 years ago, was to um, help women who were victims of torture and human trafficking um, to be able to rehabilitate in an atmosphere that was culturally appropriate. Um, I am a clinical psychologist by profession, and when I started off, I was asked by the UNHCR to give therapy to women who had just arrived through the Sinai, um, from the Sinai torture camps, and very quickly um, we realized that this was not what was needed um, for many sort of now obvious reasons, but the women were in a state of survival and also didn't really relate to the concept of therapy at all, um, and needed sort of immediate assistance, and we started a um, this organization, which was to bring women together to earn money through something that was going to be good for their soul, that was going to help them to rehabilitate and find their inner power. And um, I have a background in, um, in the arts, and I, um, as I said, I'm a psychologist, and we decided to try and um, make things that we could sell. And um, to cut a long story short, we started off with... Um, crocheting with various experiments and we landed up crocheting baskets which um, turned out to be um, very a very good choice because there's a lot of repetitive movements it's very meditative there's lots of research that shows how um, helpful um, doing um, crafts are um, for depression anxiety and PTSD post-traumatic stress and through the years um, the, the, the woman brought crafts from, from home. Some of them were not appropriate for where, for our setting that we were in because we wouldn't, were not able to get hold of the materials like um, weaving um, baskets. And also it was not going to be very um, commercial and um, because they take a long time. And with a lot of um, thought and effort, the woman started to crochet baskets, which I will hopefully be able to show you. Um, a little bit later in, the, in our talk and um, from then went on to many, many um, beautiful handcrafts that they taught each other. And um, then in 2018, we started to make art, um, which I will talk about perhaps later, which the women tell their stories through the things that they, the, the, the things that they make. We started off with collaborations. Um, and we've been at some of the major museums in Israel. We've been in galleries in New York and in Sweden. And um, and I can go through these and talk about them a bit later because uh, hopefully you'll be able to see the presentation, but they're really very um, interesting and impressive. And we're ending off right now, very close to this talk, where one of our um, managers, um, we have 11 managers, asylum seeking managers, one of them, Lena, who's in charge of art and design in the studio, is going to be one of 30 artists showing at the Israeli Biennale in March, and we're very, very proud of her for being able to tell her story to, to all of these people, it's a form of advocacy as well, so um, that's in a nutshell. Thank, thank you, Didi, thank you. Uh, so, in, in your presentations, uh, you, you've covered uh, not only what you do, but also some of uh, some of some of the things that the arts can do. Maybe we 
we, we developed that a little bit. In your, in your view, and also based on the experience that you have, what can the arts do for, for people who are experiencing uh, immigration and asylum systems or people with experience of forced migration? Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Tonton. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a question where every time when uh, I'm asked to answer such uh, uh, questions, I always uh, think about music and talk about music. And uh, I always give the answer from one sentence that said the, the power the power of music. You know, music, uh, because, because I'm a musician, I cannot talk about uh, uh, what Didi is uh, doing at Kuchinat. Maybe my wife can, but me, myself, I can't. I cannot talk only about music. I know the power of music. Um, in history, it has been shown that uh, music has the power to liberate people. Music has the power to transform the hearts and uh, even the thinking uh, of people. I've uh, realized that um, a music was the only, uh, the only key or the only way that gave me, if I can say it, <laughs> that gave me a place in uh, the Israeli uh, community. I'm talking about my own experience here in Israel. Yeah, the first time, where people could uh, come to me or where people could ask uh, to know my name or to have my phone number is uh, only when they realize that I can, uh, I can sing, I can play music, I can play guitar, I can uh, whatever. But uh, I, they couldn't focus on me as a, a human being. I'm talking in general, I'm not talking about uh, certain categories of, uh, of people. So I think, um, Music also can be used in uh, this situation uh, to give uh, to give opportunity to people to know they are uh, the people who are sitting or who are standing in front of them. I mean, sometimes when uh, not sometimes, most of the time when the asylum seekers or people are running away from their countries because of uh, the atrocities and whatever, uh, arriving in uh, different or several countries like Israel, all what they want or all what they need for the first time is to see that people are uh, people open their hand to just welcome them. They don't. Um, they don't come to they don't want them to give uh, to give money or to give uh, i don't know whatever they just want the, the hearts and uh, the eyes and the faces of people to be open to just first say welcome to them and to give them a seat and then ask them where they are coming from what is the problem uh, how come they are here and not in their countries and uh, i have, for me music can be used uh, to um, uh, to let or to spread those kind of uh, messages. You know, sometimes people are not open to other people. It's because they maybe they don't know because maybe they don't have uh, um, they don't have the good information about uh, about the people who are standing uh, standing in front of, of them. Uh, for me, we can use music because through messages, sometimes uh, when you are only talking, you are making speech on, uh, I, I don't know where, uh, sometimes it cannot work. But when you are using music uh, to, uh, let me, uh, to let your word go through, uh, this can be one of the key to help uh, those kind of people and this kind of people like me who think and which is correct that they don't uh, they are not uh, they, they are not welcome in uh, the society where they thought when they ran they ran away from uh, the atrocities in their country and think so that when they arrived in a certain place they will be welcome people will receive them and suddenly unfortunately 
they face uh, a different uh, uh, and opposite uh, situation. So if we use music uh, to let the message go around, maybe we can contribute to, uh, to uh, the amelioration of uh, uh, the situation of uh, asylum seekers. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. How, how about you, uh, Hamutau? What, what, in your view, what can the arts do for people uh, with experience of forced migration? Well, first of all, thank you for the question. Thank you for Tonton for saying so smart things. I really want to relate to what Tonton said and to present it from the point of view as a re of a researcher and an activist. Um, what we do at the hotline, part of the, our work is public advocacy. And what we try to do through cultural and artistic events is, as Tonton said, first of all, connect between the Israeli public um, and the sound seeking community. And as Tonton said, um, let this communication be um, direct and not intermediated. So for example, like often we hear um, in the media about the infiltrators and those people, a lot, like lots of even statistics numbers, which is very broad, very vague. Um, and we are used to hear, you know, Israeli people talking about asylum seekers, whether even if it's for the best, you know, even activists like us talking about asylum seeker and their rights. In those kind of cultural events in art, the Israeli public has the opportunity to meet um, asylum seekers, um, like in front, like in one, like in the first hand, like to meet them. Um, face to face, talking with them, hearing um, their stories, their voice, whether it's through music, through art, through, through craft. Um, and there is like, as Tom Thompson, there is even something that is even more subtle, I would say, even easier when you, you talk about human rights issues through art, because then you don't talk about those issues, like you don't confront the politics in Israel, and you don't talk about you know, scary words like human rights, but you can talk about the music, you can talk about the paintings and through them convey a message um, about human rights and tell the story, the personal story of people from um, their homelands. Um, and I think this is also very, very important. So I think that one of the things that we're trying to do through artistic events is activism and try to, to raise awareness to the situation of asylum seekers in Israel to every time choose one subject to do that. Um, and, to, and to enable this, you know, it's, it's sort of humanizing because, you know, people are used to know asylum seekers in all kinds of ways, but then when you see them face to face and you hear the story, it's like more a human way, sort of. It's even ridiculous to say that, but it's something that is needed. Um, I think that also, um, like, in this is from like the activist point of view, from the research point of view. I think that often um, what we see at least in Israel in their ac academic research is talking about, when we're speaking about Islam seekers, we're talking about uh, human rights, we're talking about law and justice, uh, we're talking about therapy, all kind of these kind of, uh, of, of issues. What we can do when we're speaking about art of refugees is talking about other realms in their life, which is not only human rights. Didi, I need to ask you to stop <laughs> uploading your presentation. It's Picking me out of focus. Just stop for one second. <laughs> Please, I'm, I apologize. We cannot hear you on, you're on mute. Uh, but it's just, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's confusing. Um, I'm really sorry, I didn't realize you could see it. <laughs> it's okay, no worries. Um, anyway, so what we're doing, we're, we're talking in research about other refugees. We're enabling to talk about other realms, other aspects of their life in Israel, not only about justice and human rights, but we can use the art to, to, to speak about um, those subjects too, but also about the life of asylum seekers in Israel. Um, how is, is it to live under the Israeli policy? How, it, how do they feel they're accepted in the Israeli world, in the artistic milieu um, and stuff like that? Um, we can understand maybe migration better. Um, we can understand the artists and their lives better. We can understand the public better the way that we see the art. So we have all kinds of different focuses that we can use, but they're shedding a broader light um, on the life of asylum seekers more than just talking about rights and law and, and et cetera. Um, 
And yeah, and I think that when we're talking about, obviously when we're talking about our of, out of refugees, we're talking obviously about re resilience as uh, Didi and Kikinata are trying to do, you know, to build the resilience of asylum seekers or sometimes asylum seekers are building their own resilience um, dealing with their own traumas and own past and present through the uh, through the art, um, but also we understand better um, through the art itself. We understand better the migration because as the migration uh, changes, you know, the life transforming the life and of the asylum seeker um, who are in transition, we can see those kind of aspects in their art. The way their life are in transition is performed also in the art. That the art is more dynamic. Um, it's more hybrid, um, it's transitional art, um, it's polyphonic, it's, it's um, demonstrating several voices who are coexisting together at the same time. Um, and yeah, lastly, I would just say that when we're looking about the art of asylum seekers and not only about asylum seekers and rights, asylum seekers and um, their challenges, et cetera, we're also seeing the asylum seekers from a point of view of strength, of power. Uh, for example, one of the artists that I interviewed for my ME thesis, uh, Sege Ibera, is a, a painter from Eritrea. He told me, when I'm presenting my artwork in, our, in an art exhibition, I know that the Israeli public will not only see me um, as a cleaner, you know, of the street or in a restaurant, but now they will see me as an artist. So that's a point of view of power and respect and see this kind of person as very cultivated, very uh, with rich life, rich stories, um, talent, um, et cetera. So this is another aspect um, of why we should talk about art of ref refugees. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, Amato. Uh, how about you, Didi? What, what can uh, the arts do for people seeking refuge? Yeah, um, yeah, thanks, Hamutal. That was interesting. I think you covered a lot of the, the points that are relevant. So maybe I'll speak more sort of personally from the point of view of some of our women and their art, um, what, what they might say. And maybe I'll start from the end. Um, Didi, uh, you, want to, you want to send me your presentation and I can share it for you? Would you prefer that? Yeah, you know what, I will just talk now and then after this, on the next one, um, when Tonton's speaking, I will share it with you. Thanks, that's such a nice idea. Um, and then at least people can see what we're talking about. Um, so what, what I wanted to say was that um, a, a few of our women were showing at a gallery in central Tel Aviv with two other artists, one well-known Israeli artist and a Palestinian artist. And Lena, I want to talk about, was showing three, um, two very big pieces which um, depict her um, village in South Sudan. One of them is a large tree with a bench around it where she um, describes the woman sitting and, and, and talking and doing the washing and cutting the vegetables. Another one um, is her compound where she lived. And I looked at Lena standing at the gallery with about 40 people surrounding her <laughs> and listening to her life in South Sudan and um, it really can bring me to tears to think of that because I think that usually the asylum seekers in Israel in particular, I think, are, are really um, transparent in the streets, are uh, um, at best. The, as maybe most of you are aware, there's a lot of xenophobia and racism. And all of a sudden, Lena was standing there talking about herself, not as an asylum seeker, not about her journey, not about anything about Israel, but just about her life. And everyone was listening to her um, in, enraptured. And I think that it sort of gives an example of the, the power of um, the artist to tell their story and of the art of just having a look at it and how it enthralled and entranced people. Lena and all of our, and our other woman, Mabrit, at the exhibition who'd made, um, 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 she used to make um, pots in Eritrea and she crocheted pots that looked like the pots she used to make in Eritrea. And I mean, all of them were sold and people were fascinated. Um, so that's an example of just um, respect, I would say, and, and time and presence that, that they were given, which, which meant such a lot. Um, one of the first exhibitions that we did um, was at the Haifa Museum of Art, and it was part of a group exhibition called Extremities. And our woman crocheted um, large baskets about the size of themselves. It was called a body of work. 
and each basket the women told their stories. Um, at the opening of the exhibition, there was a large portrait of each one of our women standing next to her basket with, and then there was the basket. And out of the four women showing at that exhibition, only one of them agreed to come to the opening because the others of them didn't get it. And even though we offered to help them with child minding and everything, they just didn't get what an opening of exhibition was about and why they needed to come at all. And um, the one woman that came was Salam. She came with me because I basically begged her and said, please come because, you know, people will be so disappointed not to meet the artist. And she came and there were a group of, you know, the, the place was full and our room, which was quite a big room with all these big sort of portraits and the pictures, um, there were lots of people in there and they were waiting to talk to her. They lined up to speak to her and they were asking her to explain her basket, which was stripes in different brown, black, beige and she was telling them about her feeling of being um, uh, a woman of color in Israel and how her basket represented the fact she, she would say that we all um, we all spend nine months in our mother's stomachs and we all go to the same place in the end and why does the color of my skin um, have such an influence on my on my life especially here in Israel because obviously in Eritrea it's different and People were absolutely captivated and spoke to her and discussed this fact and when, discussed everything to do with all the women's art, which was actually very moving and interesting. And when we went back to Tel Aviv, which is about an hour drive from Haifa, she said she could have flown back herself because she was on an absolute high because she had people there that were actually listening to her that were interested in what she had to say. And she felt that, um, and I think all of our women do, they, they is that they have a voice. Through their art, they have a voice. And um, not only is there the language barriers, but there's the cultural barriers, and then there's the barriers of class and of um, power. And this gives a way of actually really breaking through those barriers. You know, Kuchinati is based in a place called Kiryata Malacha, which has over 200 artists, studios and galleries, etc. And all of the artists around, you know, um, some of them more successful, some of them less successful. But our women feel very at home there. They feel one of the artists in Israel. They, in, in fact, they're probably some of the most successful artists in Israel. You, you know, not, not in all of Israel, but in this place, there's a lot of starter artists and they, they've had exhibitions in all of the major museums and their artwork and they actually crafts that we sell in our studio um, give, give our women a lot of um, esteem, I would say and pride and so does it to their families. So um, I think that's maybe to, to answer, it's sort of apart from, you know, agreeing with Hamutal about everything to do, you know, with, with, with resilience and, and everything else you said, I think the, the issue of sort of advocacy and esteem is probably the strongest, which obviously feeds into feeling a lot better about yourself. Yeah. Th th thank you, thank you. Uh, I've got a question on, uh, you know, what's what's the situation for for, for refugees and asylum seekers in, in Israel? Who wants to answer? A, 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 any of you, entirely up to you. Well, Tonton, do you want to answer maybe as an asylum seeker in Israel, <laughs> you can say? <laughs> uh, and I think uh, <laughs> and if I, Hamutal can answer much better to this question, what is uh, the situation of uh, asylum seekers in Israel? Um, if, it, if it's up to me, I think I can uh, not give a good answer because if uh, when I say the situation is bad, that's not the answer. So what is bad? Maybe uh, Hamutal can... Uh, I answer bit, much better on that one. Is uh, the situation of asylum seekers in Israel bad, Hamutaz? Uh, well, Tuntan is one of the leaders of the Congolese community, of asylum seekers community in Israel. So he can answer very good. He already spoke in the Knesset, in the Israeli parliament. He's fighting for the rights of asylum seekers. Uh, he's, he's very, <laughs> he's not only a musician, he's also an activist. <laughs> <laughs> He's just being uh, humble. Um, yeah, so as Tom said, the situation of asylum seekers in Israel is bad. Uh, we just um, have a new government um, that was elected in the last elections. 
um, and the government is very right wing. Um, they are starting to speak now about what kind of rules and procedures and laws they can do to harm the um, rights of asylum seekers in Israel. And I think that's what our former um, interior minister said in 2013 um, <laughs> expresses well uh, the way that our government has been treating asylum seekers for the past almost 20 years. Um, so Eli Shai, <laughs> our former interior minister said in 2013 that he wants to make the life of infiltrators, asylum seekers, um, unbearable so that they will leave Israel voluntarily because Israel signed the uh, Refugee Convention in 1951. Uh, we, we never made it a part of the Israeli law, but we are obligated uh, to the convention. Um, so asylum seekers in Israel, like a person who submitted an asylum request in Israel, normally is protected from deportation to their homeland, but Israel can make their life, as Elishai said, unbearable, um, such as, um, doing uh, the deposit law, which takes 20% out of their salary to encourage them to leave Israel, um, opening the detention center uh, that was open, as I said before, from uh, 2013 until 2018, incarcerating men um, in, this, um, in this detention center. Um, now the, um, uh, the group protection of asylum seekers from Congo uh, was uplifted, so Normally, they can deport asylum seekers from Congo if their asylum request was uh, denied or if they never submitted an asylum request. Um, they started a new procedure of limiting where they can work. So they, uh, for a procedure that is gonna start soon and now we're fighting again this procedure uh, in court. Um, he's saying that the, the asylum seekers cannot work in 17 cities in Israel, which are obviously the biggest and the most important cities where you have most uh, job options, um, job opportunities, and where asylum seekers live. Um, so you cannot live in those places. Something that the new government government also wants to, pr to promote um, is that they cannot not only work, but also live in those cities, um, and eventually promoting the deportation of asylum seekers. So basically, the Israeli government, unfortunately, is trying uh, to make their life as difficult um, as possible to make them feel depressed as much as possible so they will leave. And unfortunately the government succeed because the biggest amount of asylum seekers we had in Israel several years ago was almost, was a little bit more than 60,000 um, asylum seekers. And now we have something like 25,000. So more than half of the asylum seekers already left. Uh, we have just uh, as a comparison, um, so normally the process in Israel, like as other countries goes, a person submit a sound request. Normally their request is supposed to be reviewed. Um, this person is interviewed if their testimony um, is found true. Um, normally they're supposed to have a refugee status. A refugee status in Israel gives uh, a temporary residence. So it's a different kind of visa, which gives many rights. Israel has given um, this kind of visa of a refugee status for less than half percent. Okay, 99.5, 99.5% did not receive an, a, a refugee status. And um, a report that we published at the hotline shows that most of the asylum requests were not even reviewed. They didn't, they, I mean, they, maybe they invited the person to an interview, but most of the asylum seekers were, uh, asylum requests were not even, uh, didn't re receive any final uh, uh, response. So while Israel does deny many asylum requests, most of the sound requests were not even checked. Like you see Tonton, he's been in Israel for seven years. His sound request is still open for seven years. Our, I think most, um, that, that, like our client at the hotline that has like the most time, that has been uh, the longest time in Israel is almost 30 years. She's also from the Congo and also her request, she didn't receive a response yet. So this is kind of a policy that Israel does of not checking the sound requests until um, the reason why the person had to flee his own homeland will not be relevant anymore. And then they could deny the asylum request and eventually deport this kind of person. So basically overall the policy, um, yeah, as Tonton said in his words, is really bad. Mm -hmm. 
Th th thank you. And uh, is that is that the same uh, in, in your view, uh, Didi? Uh, you're, you're, you're mute. Yes, absolutely. It's a it's a very um, unhappy situation, unfortunately. Um, and um, we um, are really scared as to what um, is going to be with the with the with this new government, and um, not overly optimistic. But um, let's hope for the best. Mm. And and just thinking about uh, what happens while people are waiting. Um, we've had uh, Tonton has, has been seeking refuge for for, for seven years. Uh, Hamato has spoken about uh, someone who's been who's been in the asylum system for 30 years. What happens while they are in that state? Um, are they allowed to work, uh, study? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's a, there's a law of compulsory um, education. So there is schools, but I have to point out that the schools um, in Tel Aviv are segregated. So there's schools for asylum seekers um, and the level of schooling at these schools um, is inferior um, to other schools, according to the parents and actually teachers at other schools. Like when a child transfers from Tel Aviv area to another school, the teachers are like, what are these kids been learning? This is just what I've, what I've been hearing. In addition, the, if there was some kind of hope in the beginning for asylum seekers arriving, um, where they felt that perhaps they'd come to a democracy, perhaps something, um, perhaps they would get protection, perhaps things would change, perhaps things would get better. Right now, there's a real state of hopelessness, of um, claustrophobia. I would say probably 99.9% .9 of asylum seekers want to leave Israel and go to a country where they can get a durable solution. And um, this, this hopelessness increases as the children get older, because while they, the children were, were younger, obviously, 10 years ago, now we have um, school leavers. And we've got like a, a, the largest group of children are between seven and 12 years old, I believe. And they're going to be getting to the stage where they finish school and they're not facing, um, you, you know, while they might have felt actually integrated in Israeli society in some way that they knew Hebrew, maybe they went to scouts, maybe they joined in basketball, football, you know, they, they kind of felt like that they belonged in some kind of a way, perhaps. Um, you finish school and if you don't have money for university, which um, on the whole is taking sort of foreign fees for university, then um, you, the, the, a lot of the children get into depression because they can't go to university, they're not going to go to the army, that's for Israelis. They can't do other things that Israeli kids do, such as preparatory programs. There's a few. I mean, there are efforts being made to try and improve the situation. But if I can say on the whole, um, the situation is, is very upsetting, it really is. Um, and um, we're a bit pessimistic at the moment. Maybe if you speak to us in a few weeks, uh, maybe something would have changed because right now we're in the, the midst of it. You might have seen on TV huge protests against this, this government. So um, but I'm, I'm hoping that maybe there'll be a bit more room for optimism in a few weeks, but uh, I don't know how the others feel. So I'm seeing Sigal here and, and Tom Tan and, and everyone. Yeah. yeah. And, and what's the. Uh like uh, political and also media discourse around refugees and asylum seekers. What is it like in Israel? Who wants to answer? Yeah, 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 mute. Don't you're on mute. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for some reasons I just disappeared from the <laughs> the conference didn't know. I don't know where I, but uh, I'm back. Thank you. Uh, as it has been said here, um, the political situation of asylum seekers in Israel, uh, I mean, there is a line uh, that uh, the right wing government had uh, fixed already. Is uh, as, as Hamutar said before, is uh, to make the life of a asylum seeker, they don't call them asylum seekers, they call he, uh, them uh, infiltrators, uh, to make the life of the infiltrators unbearable. So you, you can have the, 
the map or the picture of uh, what is the politic of uh, uh, the government. It's just uh, the right wing government doesn't want at all uh, asylum seekers in Israel. That's it. It means uh, their will or their wish is to, to wake up tomorrow morning that uh, they will walk around uh, uh, the streets. There's no more asylum seeker from uh, whatever country it is. Uh, unfortunately, most of them are from, uh, are from Africa because we, it has been noticed that uh, other asylum seekers from uh, other places or from other places uh, other than Africa are a little bit, um, uh, I can say, well treated, even though it's not uh, for the majority of them, but uh, for a, a big, a big number of them are well treated, uh, are better treated than uh, those coming from uh, from Africa, and we can understand already uh, which kind of government or which kind of politic uh, they. Yeah, with the line they are they are following. As we said before, I am here in Israel since now seven years. Uh, I apply for asylum seeking, and uh, they just talk to me once to ask me who am I, where I'm coming from, write your story, what did you, uh, why did you uh, <laughs> uh, come out of your country, and that's it. And uh, they never call me. They, I'm trying with uh, my lawyer to, sometimes I go to my lawyer to tell her, so let's push it and uh, ask them to just check on my case. So what they say, this government, uh, there are, you have only seven years here. And there are people who are here for 30 years and their cases have never been checked. So when you want to push yours, they say, ah, okay, yes, well, you know, we have people 30 years. We will start 30 years before, and then we maybe arrive to him. So imagine, and uh, as uh, Hamutal said, uh, until now, many of the reasons why most of the people uh, fled their countries, uh, when you go now to interviews or whatever, why did you, uh, <laughs> why did you leave your country? When you start to give reasons, there are uh, there are reasons that you. Uh, you had 30 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, the situation changed, even though it, it didn't change in a good uh, way, but uh, the situation changed. Uh, so this is uh, the politic of uh, the Israeli uh, government to just, I always summarize it in one sentence, they never and they don't want a asylum seekers in uh, this country. Unfortunately, they signed the Geneva Convention <laughs> that they, if uh, there, there are asylum seekers who come, they can protect them and whatever. Unfortunately, it's uh, only papers. Uh, the reality is something else. Mm. Thank, thank, thank you, thank you. Very, very de depressing uh, uh, what's happening. Uh, how about you, Hamutau and, and Didi? Do, do you want to add anything on uh, the, the discourse on refugees and asylum seekers in, in Israel, political and also media? Well, yeah, first of all, you asked, you asked before about whether asylum seekers can work in Israel. So in the past, it was written on their visa that it's not um, a visa of work, so it doesn't mean they can work. Um, following an appeal to the Supreme Court, eventually the Supreme Court says that Israel cannot deny um, their right to work. So formally, according to the law, they're not allowed to work, but Israel cannot enforce <laughs> this prohibition. So technically, they can work. Legally, they can work. So it's not a working visa. They don't receive all the rights that um, workers receive in Israel in a working visa. But technically, they can work, and the police cannot enforce the prohibition <laughs> that denies uh, their rights to work. So that's also like the way you, our government thinks. Like they don't want to give them rights, but you know the Supreme Court kind of enforced them to give certain rights. 
Um, and now what the government is trying to do is to pass a law that, that will, that it's a horrible law. <laughs> this is why we have so many manifestations against this new government, not because of the asylum seekers, unfortunately, but because that the government wants to make the power of the Supreme Court um, less stronger. So the Supreme Court cannot um, stop the new government and the Knesset, the Israeli parliament from passing laws that are not, well, we don't have a constitution, but we have like basic laws. So every time that the, the government and the Knesset wants to pass law that are against those, those basic law, you know, the, the most um, 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 important laws, uh, you know, of a state. So every time the Supreme Court says, you know, this is against the basic law, it's against, you know, basic rights, human rights. Um, so in the past, you know, the, the Supreme Court could do that, to stop the government and the Knesset from, you know, passing horrible laws. Now the new government and the new Knesset wants to pass a law that will take this power of the Supreme Court um, and basically will, will not able the Supreme Court uh, to monitor uh, the Knesset's work um, and to stop anything that is, you know, very basically against human rights. Um, so how do we speak about asylum seekers in the media? It depends which kind of channel you open in your TV. Um, you have some channels that are very right wing, very pro religion, and therefore are, you know, as Tonton said, are calling asylum seekers infiltrators, um, are quoting right wing activists and politicians. Um, you know, one of our former, former uh, ministers called asylum seekers from Sudan cancer. She said they are cancer in our body, in the nation, in the body of our nation. So you have kind of um, mainstream but more right-wing um, um, news media that will show this kind of um, unfortunate saying, but you have al also other channels that will show stories that are more pro asylum seekers um, and also newspapers that are showing stories that are more pro asylum seekers. As I said before, and also as, as Didi mentioned, there is a huge um, conflict in Israel in these days Every Saturday night, um, every Monday, we have huge manifestations of 80,000 people um, trying to resist to the government's actions. But as I said before, this is mostly against um, other actions of the government and not necessarily about the Psalm seekers. Um, those kind of laws that the Knesset is trying to pass will harm badly Psalm seekers. Um, for example, if we will try um, as an NGO uh, to apply to the Supreme Court, and but the Supreme Court doesn't have um, any strength uh, to to protect their uh, human rights, you know, basic human rights of asylum seekers. So that's a huge problem for us too. But the, the idea, the subject of asylum seekers, um, is less in the focus of the media, media today, even though that um, they're still interviewing asylum seekers. Um, also, with the situation of asylum seekers from Ukraine, um, that was a lot of in the news in the past year. Um, but now the struggle is against other actions of the government. Um, and there's something else I want to say, but I forgot. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't know, Didi, do you, do you want to add anything on, on, on this? Okay, so my, my next question would then be, uh, what can the, the arts do? Uh, what can the arts contribute to, especially arts, by people with the experience of forced migration, what can they contribute to to the discourse on on migration that's taking place in in Israel? Maybe I can start with that if it's okay. Yeah. Okay. So, following uh, in continuation to what we said, what we discussed just now. Um, so, Tonton mentioned the fact that. And also, I, uh, the fact that Israel signed the Refugee Convention. Historically, that was, you know, a few years after the Holocaust, after the Second World War. And Israel was the, one of the countries um, to formulate the convention and one of the first states uh, to sign this convention because we're saying, you know, we were refugees during the Holocaust. Um, we want to make sure that this kind of situation never repeats itself where Jewish people uh, will have to search for refuge, um, you know, in other countries in the world and the countries will shut their door. So I think that the, the idea of Holocaust um, is one of the core 
um, issues when we're speaking about asylum seekers in Israel. And I think what, what's interesting is the way that the Shoah, you know, the Jewish Holocaust, is used as both um, political parties um, to speak about pro and against refugees' rights. So the camp that is saying, uh, we should deny the entrance of uh, refugees to Israel. And as Tim Tom said, our dreams to make all the refugees go, go away from here. Um, maybe I'll, I will add, yes, in the beginning, we treated white Christian asylum seekers you know, from Ukraine better than we treated other asylum seekers. But now the situation of both groups is very bad. So now our interior minister managed to equalize <laughs> the bad rights that she's giving to everyone. So now. Both Ukrainians and asylum seekers from African countries are treated badly in both ways, like in, in all ways. Um, and the purpose, I think, why we have this kind of uh, <laughs> um, equality between um, African asylum seekers and Ukrainian asylum seekers is because the idea for the right wing um, um, parties is that if you're not Jewish, you're not welcome here. So yeah, if you're black, we'll treat you even worse but every person who's not Jewish, it's very hard to find a home in Israel um, and to receive a legal status. And what's, you know, the, pro, the against refugees are, are using the Shoah, the Holocaust, as an excuse, they're saying, um, well, you know, when we were in Europe, um, you know, and there was a Jewish genocide, and we tried to find refuge with other countries, the other countries closed their door, and Jewish people didn't see, didn't feel safe during, you know, the history, and it's not only the Holocaust, during you know, hundreds of years, we did not feel safe um, living abroad you know, in other countries, you know, in the exile. So this is why it's very important you know, for us, you know, the Jewish people, to have Israel as a Jewish country, and it should be a home only for Jewish people. Um, and we should not let anyone who's uh, not Jewish to enter and live here and to have any rights. And it's true that now asylum seekers are very few, are only 25,000, but the government says, their excuse is that if we're given um, special, uh, okay, a uh, legal status to some seekers here, now many more will come because you know wars will never end. Um, so they're using the Holocaust as an excuse to contain Israel as a Jewish country and not to let anyone who's not Jewish inside and to make everyone who's not Jewish go outside. Um, the Shah is also used by the pro refugees camp saying that we were once refugees, and that, that's actually a mosaic that uh, Kuchinata did um, in Tel Aviv, a beautiful mosaic saying, we were once refugees, and therefore <laughs> we understand more than everyone, than anyone, our responsibility towards our other refugees, because we know, you know, my own family was Holocaust survivor. I have family who died in the Holocaust, and this is why I became pro-refugees um, activist, because I'm saying, my family did not find a shelter and asylum in Europe. So I understand more than anyone the importance of giving a refuge to other people. Um, and so I think this kind of our history and the Jewish narrative and the historical narrative and the Zionist narrative are used um, in this kind of political game for both um, parties, for both camps. I do think that you know, maybe it's the way that the politicians are speak are speaking, but I feel that in their heart, many are just using refugees in order to get more um, votes. Um, and this is some, something that we saw with our former, former interior minister, Ayala Chichad, um, that every time that the government had a problem, when the government fell, when every time the coalition had an uncovered problem, she passed a new procedure against refugees in order to gain more votes. Um, and this is a very sad that they are being used um, you know, the, the fact that you, you can make people feel depressed um, and miserable just in order that the politicians will gain more power. That's horrible. Um, but I do think that the Shoah and the Jewish narrative are used um, in a very interesting way in Israel. Um, yes, I don't know if I answered your question, but I want to, to add this. <laughs> that, that was a very, very important context. The, the, the question itself was, um, what can the, the arts uh, contribute or do to the conversation that's taking place in Israel around forced migration?
Uh, yes, yes. Before, uh, before I answer to this question, maybe I can just add one sentence to uh, what Hamutaz just said. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Jews, um, I mean, what well, they are always uh, using as a Jewish country or Jewish uh, uh, conception or uh, whatever, they always uh, forget that it comes from a, a religion point of view. And that religion point of view, uh, what uh, has it, uh, its origin from the Bible? And what the Bible even say about that is even different from what they are. That they always try to, to tell people. If we read in uh, Exodus chapter 22, it says, Thou shalt not mistreat the foreigner, nor oppress him, for you were stranger in the land of Egypt. <laughs> Which means if uh, there is a country that could uh, welcome very uh, with uh, two uh, uh, two hands, uh, foreigners or asylum seekers or refugees is Israel. Because if they said uh, this country is based on uh, a religious point of view, on the stand on the Bible, so they have to respect this, uh, 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 this obligation from the Bible. You, we, you shall never oppress the stranger who is in your country or who lives in your country. It means from the beginning, it has been shown that uh, all strangers or uh, people coming from other countries will always live in uh, this land of Israel. It's in their Bible. It's in their, uh, in, the, in, in what they think that is uh, their, uh, their constitution, because they said that the country is based on uh, the Bible. So this is the Bible talking here. You shall never oppress. Exodus chapter 22, verse uh, 21. Maybe I will get the opportunity to teach uh, the Bible to those uh, uh, religious um, uh, persons. Uh, thank you very much. Eh, <laughs> I don't remember the question. <laughs> okay. all right. That's all right. How about you? Thank you. Amutal, would you be kind enough to share the slideshow that I sent you? Yes. Because I think sure. some of the pictures will be nice to show because I think that I'm going to, it's like neatly follows on from what you were talking about with the connection with um, where, where we're trying to sort of create a bridge with Israeli society. Um, and we found that we do um, and so in the the first slide which will did come he, up in a minute I, is one of the most it to me? I don't see it where did you send it to me email your email my work email or my personal email? yeah your work email oh at hotline so it, send it take me a up? second because it's a different computer. No problem. I can, <laughs> I can talk about it, but if you find it, that will be just okay, more just interesting. Okay, try talking and I'll, I'll up. It will take me a minute. Yeah. No problem. Okay. So what I wanted to say was through um, what Kuchinate tried to do, tries to do is to really create um, some kind of um, compassion and um, empathy um, that trying to create, to um, activate compassion and empathy in our, in our visit, in people that come to our studio, people that come to our shows, etc. And so when we started off, we did, like as Hamutal said, this big wall that said we were all once refugees in one of the major streets in Tel Aviv, which was a mosaic wall, which was actually... Um, a little bit like graffiti because we didn't get permission, but it actually stayed up there for a long time. And we got a lot of tags and shares on Instagram and people commenting on it. Um, and the woman that did it, the artisans that did it felt amazing because they just felt that they were doing something. And then we um, did a um, piece of artwork with a well-known artist called Gilly Effman at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, which was, um, um, which was about the Holocaust, sort of a bit of a different take on the Holocaust. But what we did was our woman um, created um, 
this big hedge, which you might see in a minute, made of very intricate crocheted leaves. And the way they did it was with Israelis. They, um, the museum put up a notice um, a month before the exhibition and said, we're looking for Israelis in United Crochet to come and learn to crochet these leaves with asylum seekers. And so our woman taught Israelis how to crochet these and it created sort of a very, a very nice sort of, um, uh, a very nice sort of conversation with the woman and a, a nice bond in a different kind of a way of sitting and learning to make something from the artisans. And then um, after that, um, we we had the, the exhibition and the leaves were to do with, that the, um, they were referenced to on the way to the gas chambers during the, um, during the Holocaust, there was an instruction by the Third Reich that all of the, um, that all of the all of the parts to the gas chamber should be filled with foliage, and so we created these leaves to, as a reference to that. And the leaves were South um, West African Namibian leaves. And the first holo the first genocide um, apparently was in South West Africa, and um, this was a reference to that. So trying to in a very subtle way, create these connections because in Israel, this is a very, very, very sensitive subject. And if you go down to Art Hamotel, then you will find, it says Art, and then you'll see um, the leaves. I can see them now. Yeah, you can just so, press on that. Yeah, I'm looking for the leaves. Where is it exactly? In which? Yeah, you just have to go up a bit, go up a little bit. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not able to see so small. Just press on one of them and then I'll recognize you. Yeah, I think go back that, that's it, right? Uh, there we go. That's it. Oh, yeah. So it was called Kibbutz Bokhenberg. Yeah. And the, this is the hedgerow of leaves that was created. And um, it was, it created a big impact because first of all, um, the signature on this piece of artwork was our um, artisans at Kuchy United together with 200 Israeli women um, and no men, unfortunately, but um, that was in itself something new that we've done. Um, we were very proud that the Tel Aviv Museum of Art acquired this piece of art for their permanent collection. And then um, another exhibition in, um, wanted us to make another, um, to, wanted us to show the whole exhibit in Austria. And so we made another one with a um, not-for-profit organization that helps survivors of the Holocaust. And so our artisans were together with survivors of the Holocaust creating these leaves um, and they went to them because a lot of them are very elderly now. It was actually the most beautiful meetings that happened over two weeks creating this. And um, there was a lot of sort of common conversations and laughing and crying. And at the end of it, some of the um, Israeli Holocaust survivors dedicated the leaves on this bush that they'd made to family members who had perished in the Holocaust. And I really think that this whole um, sort of, um, piece of artwork installation that we did together really did um, do its job in sort of opening up hearts and minds and in creating some kind of compassion and empathy and connection with the story of the asylum seekers um, together with the story of these um, Israeli Holocaust survivors. And um, I think that that's an example and will go nicely with what Hamutal were, were, was saying um, about that. And um, I think that's for now in terms of your question, which was about, um, sorry, I, lost, I went back. Yeah, there's we were all once refugees of us making the mosaic in, in the street in Tel Aviv. Um, yeah, and we go on to come up with new ideas and do more things that are, um, that are, are, are pushing people to stop and look and listen. For example, we did um, mobiles. Maybe you can find them there, Hamotal. We did these mobiles for Illustration Week, which our woman, um, did mobiles with um, with um, felt, and um, they sh they told the story of their lives through these mobiles, which people couldn't stop. It was in their faces, and there was a video next to it with a woman telling a story. So here we have Hush. Um, it was called Hanging by a Thread. This is um, Ashok from South Sudan, who showed the picture. Um, who showed a mobile from her village where, when she was seven, her village was burnt, and you've got the um, the village uh, um, with fire coming out of it, winds at the top, which can quite be seen people running. 
and again, this is something that it creates emotion. That's what, um, you, you know, we're not talking to people's heads. We, we're talking to people's hearts and souls. And I think if you're able to do that and touch someone, then maybe something can move. We need to try everything. Um, and in addition, it gives the woman a, a amount of, um, of closure when they're able to do something like this and tell their story in this way and also um, speak it and, and, and make it. And the whole process of making it is also very therapeutic. Um, you're welcome to ask your question again of all of us. And then if everyone, I, don't, I hope I answered your question as well. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I think what, what we now do is uh, we tend to to people who are in the in the audience, in case uh, you've got questions, comments, anything you want to say, uh, this is your chance. Uh, if you unmute and and just uh, yeah, does does anyone who is listening have a question, a comment? Cigar. Let's start with a cigar. <laughs> So, well, I just wanted to say it was very interesting. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And, and what's, your, what's your connection uh, with the Ask Sigal? Uh, I'm also from the Hotline for Refugees and Migrants, and I know all the people in the panel, so. <laughs> ah, okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Maybe uh, if you had a, a nice story you want, if no one has a question yeah. about the connection yeah. of all three of us. Uh, who asked what, I also what, want to say what, that Sigal is a very good crocheter, so <laughs> uh, that's important. <laughs> uh, she's, the head of, she's the head of the neighborhood. Uh, Good, 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 good to know that, good to hear that. Uh, um, does anyone have a question before we go back to, to our panelists? This is your chance. Uh, Ofa says, I just want to say thank you for all the work all that you do. That you do. <laughs> thank you, Ofa. Ofa, hello. Uh, yeah, Ofer, I, I, I grabbed this opportunity to thank Ofer. Ofer was uh, one of the musicians that uh, accepted to join uh, my concert to just play um, free of charge. Uh, he played the uh, best guitar in that concert. And uh, Ofer, thank you very much. <laughs> so so maybe we, we, we go back to you, uh, our panelists. Uh, Maybe if you could, you, you've got uh, final words. Anything you want to emphasize or, or just, you know, your, your, your final words or final comments? I... Uh, as, as it has been said, we are, we are just in that uh, environment of uh, trying to uh, trying to make things happen, trying to push uh, things by uh, forcing people to really know who and what we are instead of uh, just thinking of us as uh, infiltrators, <laughs> as they always uh, said. And this is why even uh, in uh, my, uh, my, in the choir, all the performances we, we, always have now we are going to uh different old old home ages uh and um we for you and for you to know we go around uh there is a uh, uh uh what what we call in uh in hebrew i just forget we uh add me a stream it's a uh, the beta vote that has uh, different connections of uh, many, many old home uh, and old age home uh, in Israel. And uh, all of the time in our, um, during our performances, we are obliged to every one or two or three songs to just stop and have three or two minutes to just explain people about 
who we are, why we had to run our country. And uh, it, it has been a, a good experience since uh, when we leave uh, a place where we perform, uh, people have a different image of, of us. Uh, though the, a different image from the one they always get from uh, those uh, right wing uh, media or television. And they are, oh, they are op people who have uh, uh, different images, different uh, 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 road who can make things happen. And now we are going places, we are going uh, uh, in different uh, halls. Last time we performed in. Um, in a very big, uh, a very uh, well-known uh, uh, hall here in, in, in Israel called uh, Shablul. Uh, Sigal, I invited you. You didn't come, but I hope you'll come uh, next time. And uh, we left from there. People, uh, they are not, it's not a big, uh, it's not a big, uh, a, a big number of people, but at least 10 100, 200, 500 people know that uh, oh, these are not uh, infiltrators as uh, they, 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 as they presented them to us. They are people with uh, different lives, people with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with skills, people with, uh, that can be also useful uh, to the, our community, to our country, and uh, to our society. And this is what we are focusing on to just uh, show to Israel that we, there is something that we can add to the Israeli society. There is something we can also do. We are not here only to look for a job, as they said. Uh, we didn't come to look for a bread. We didn't come to look for what to eat. Oh, we had enough in our countries. But we had to flee uh, because we, it has it has been difficult to live in a country where uh, democracy is not respected, where the human rights uh, are not respected. That's the only reason why we are here, but not what all those uh, politicians from the right wing uh, always said in uh, along the days. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank you, Amis. Um, Didi, uh, Hamutau, any, any final thoughts? Yeah. Thanks, Tonton. I found it really sort of moving and actually depressing, really depressing what you just said. Like, we have, you know, through what we do, we have to show that we're more than just um, people who are coming to work. I mean, really, it's, 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 it's really pathetic. Um, of course, you know, um, but I'll come to Shablu. So, yeah, please, please. <laughs> It sounds great. Um, maybe we could even do something together with Cucinate. I just want to have a lot more to add. I just say that now in this um, sort of atmosphere um, of real sort of fear and increasing oppression in Israel, that um, I think that we at Cucinate are going to be coming out with a lot more um, protest art. Um, everyone's talking about and thinking because it gives people power, feels it like in a time of sort of hopeless and hopelessness and helplessness, at least you can do something um, and um, show it and, and feel better while making it. And I think this is a really interesting conversation. And um, thank you for inviting me to take part in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Didi. Um, I will add an anecdote that will try to connect, first of all, how Didi, Tonton, and I are connected, and also for the hotline, um, but also to, to connect to what Tonton said about the, the Bible. Um, so <laughs> in the hotline, we produced um, Haggadah for Passover. That's like the book that you read during the ceremony, um, the first eve of Passover, which is like seven nights in total, so the first one. Um, and it's like the most uh, very traditional, very religious text. And basically the text is telling the story of the, is the Jewish exodus, the way that we um, managed to, um, to, to uh, run away from Egypt, that where we were slaves, and then uh, we were liberated thanks to God. And then we start to be a pupil, uh, a people, sorry. Um, and then eventually we reached uh, Israel. So that's like the biblical story. And what we did at the hotline 
we took this uh, Haggadah, which is the traditional text. It, it has like a um, this um, okay. version of the Let's how to the story. So you gotta put yourself on mute. <laughs> uh it's okay <laughs> um and so we took the traditional text of the story of the exodus so that every family um read you know the first eve of the uh, passover like every jewish family in israel and uh, abroad and but what we did was to put alongside the text also art made by refugees in israel whether it's paintings uh, photographs uh, poetry etc and I just, for example, I can share with you, uh, like this is one of the pages. So the, the traditional text is telling like how we were once slaves in Egypt. And then thanks to God, uh, we were liberated and we ran away through the desert and eventually we reached Israel. Now, this story is a little bit parallel to the story of asylum seekers in Israel that were you know, in very difficult uh, conditions in their homelands. They managed to run away, many of them through um, you know, a very hard journey in the desert, through Egypt, and then eventually they arrived to Israel, where they're searching you know, to, be, uh, to, to be free eventually, uh, or finally, pardon me, uh, to be free, to build a life, to build a future for themselves, for their children. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of hope. And what happened is that we did, um, um, an event last year to, you know, to publish this Haggadah and we did it with collaboration with Kuchinate at their store in uh, Tel Aviv. And we had Tonton and his wife Lily came uh, to sing songs, you know, from uh, the, this Haggadah talking about how we were once refugees and then we were liberated. And it, it was a beautiful event, very, very, very sweet. Many people came. Um, and it, we also presented the artwork that itself inside the store of Kuchinate. Um, and then people who are calling themselves activists um, against refugees, um, who are basically very racist people, some of them very cruel, the way that they behave uh, with refugees, with children and refugees. They're doing horrible things, they're saying horrible things. Um, and when Tonton and Lily sang their song about liberation, um, and, you know, trying to, basically what we try to do in this event and also through the Haggadah is trying, showing this parallelism and saying, you know, we have the, a responsibility as a Jewish people, you know, with all the biblical um, um, history that we have, with the Jewish history that we have, with the Holocaust, with every, everything, we have the responsibility towards refugees in Israel. So this is what we try to, to, to say, to convey uh, through the Haggadah and ceremony. And those people who are screaming at the background trying to make Tonton and Lily stop singing. And it was a beautiful, beautiful way to see the way that, you know, Tonton and Lily resilience, the way that they just stood there and kept singing. It was very, very moving moment. And eventually what happened naturally is that a group of Israelis who are supporting refugees <laughs> built a wall, you know, between Tonton and Lily and those uh, right-wing whatever, very bad people, I, I will not call them uh, activists, and they just build a human wall to protect Lily and Tintone. Um, if you want, and we have time, we have the video um, showing the way Lily and Tintone sing, sing. If not, it's also okay, but I just want to share this kind of very, very moving moment that we were all uh, together, you know, in collaboration in this moment, and it's like sort of connecting between the way that we can also see through the Jewish history and the Jewish Bible, the way that we actually should support asylum seekers um, and their rights and to protect them and not treat them, you know, the way that we were once treated and we understand we shouldn't treat other people um, as, you know, the Jewish, uh, the biblical uh, command, you know, you must, I don't know how to translate it into English, but you must love the other the way that you love yourself. Uh, so that's, yourself. Thank you, Didi. <laughs> And thank you all people who are writing comments um, on the chat. Um, we really like to learn more about also sound, uh, sound seekers art abroad. So thank you for that. So, so on, 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 on that note, uh, we, we will say uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you to our, to our panelists. Uh, thank you, Tonton. Thank you, Amutau. Thank you, Didi. Uh, this event is part of 
forced migration in the arts, which is a, a series of rolling online conversations looking at uh, the connection or what the arts can say about forced migration and vice versa, looking at the connection between forced migration and the arts. Uh, the aim of uh, the series is to bring together people with lived experience of forced migration, artists, academics, uh, activists for, for conversation on forced migration in the arts. Uh, our next event in the series is going to be, is, is taking place next uh, on, on Thursday, the 30th of March from 6 p.m. until 7.30 p.m. again, and it's going to focus on on, on academia. Uh, you are all welcome to, to, to attend. I will also send links to that event uh, when we've processed uh, this video and have made it uh, publicly accessible. So until then, have a wonderful evening and, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.